Uh, right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, um, some results about um, uh, MCMC for intractable likelihoods. So this is not the doubly intractable type where you would do ABC. It's the, um, well, same, like uh, the just intractable, not doubly intractable. And this is joint work with several people. So um, um, and they're listed here. In fact, uh, the last two um, I haven't had. Um, I didn't add the slides because I would probably run out of time. I'm probably going to run out of time as it is, anyways. So, um, but uh, if I get a chance, I'll talk about it a little bit about uh, the paper. Um, okay. So. Okay. Right. So the basic context is that of uh, latent variable models. That's what gives rise to the intractability. So we've got a latent process, which for simplicity, we assume here to be IID. Um, they're coming from some distribution mu theta. And then we've got observations, which are coming from some likelihood function g theta that depends on the latent variable at time t. So, um, um, so um, the likelihood then of uh, the parameter theta given observations x1 to t is essentially given by a, an integral over the latent states. Um, now, you can make this more complicated by taking the ZTs to form Markov chain. So you have an HMM, like hidden Markov model or state space model. And uh, this class of models is very, um, very popular in machine learning and statistics. Um, now, the issue with, so let's say you want to do Bayesian inference on this type of model. So you've got some prior, then the posterior again takes the form of a, a potentially high dimensional integral over um, the latent variables, so uh, the Zs, and the traditional MCMC schemes try to bypass this by um, essentially using the joint uh, likelihood, so um, theta and Z1 to T, uh, given uh, the observations, um, and then you can split this and uh, sample for, and do like a Gibbs type scheme, sampling iteratively first from the latent variables given theta and the observations, and then sampling from theta given the um, latent and observable uh, variables. So the problem with this type of scheme is that in, so in many cases, it's very hard to sample from uh, the latents given the observations. In some cases, um, it may be you, we may only have access to forward simulation from the um, um, hidden to the uh, observe, from the hidden variables to the observation. And even when implementable, schemes like this can converge very, very slowly, mainly because of correlations uh, among successive states of the latent variable, especially in state-space models where um, uh, successive latent variables tend to be very highly correlated. Um, okay, so um, the ideal um, scenario would be um, that we were able to run um, uh, standard MCMC targeting directly the, um, the marginal um, uh, dis well, the distribution of the, um, the, posterior, the marginal posterior. Um, so let's say we've integrated over the latent and we've got the marginal posterior, then the acceptance ratio would look something like this, where you've got the, the prior, you've got the likelihood, and you've got the uh, proposal. The problem is here, um, this is intractable in the sense that um, it's very com uh, it may be very expensive to compute or even impossible to compute. So the basic idea of the pseudo marginal is to instead of computing it, let's just estimate it. So uh, we're assuming we've got um, some sort of uh, instrumental random variables u coming from some distribution, um, and essentially we use them and the uh, and the hidden variables to build an estimator of the likelihood of the marginal likelihood. So what we need is that the estimator is non-negative and unbiased. Okay. Then essentially you write down the acceptance probability. So now if you do the cancellation here, it's just Metropolis Hastings replacing the estimator of the likelihood for the likelihood. I've written it like this because this way you separate the true likelihood ratio and the noise in the likelihood in the likelihood ratio um, estimator. Um, and then you proceed as normally, you accept with this probability, you reject otherwise, and so on and so forth. Okay? So um, it's actually a valid algorithm, so it does sample from the correct uh, distribution. To see that, you have to consider it as a Metropolis-Hastings algorithm in an extended state space where you include the variables you use for generating the estimators, and that's useful for something I'm going to mention later on. Um, okay, so essentially we can still do MCMC. Obviously, um, now um, this thing tends to be much more 
uh, difficult, much more complex to analyze uh, because of the randomness in the uh, proposal um, that's arising from the, es the estimation of the likelihood. So how do we estimate? So um, tr um, typically we can use uh, important sampling estimators. So for latent variables, uh, it's a very easy calculation to show that this is unbiased and non-negative because all of these terms are non-negative. For state space models, uh, things are slightly more complicated. Ideally, you want to use a particle filter because otherwise the variance will be exploding very, very quickly as the number of observations increases. But with a particle filter for state space models, the variance, the relative variance at least, is bounded um, uniformly over time, as long as the number of particles is proportional to t. And this is also the case for the IIID model. So you need the number of particles, and by particles I mean this n here, the, um, the number of particles you use to build your um, likelihood estimator, you want that to be proportional to t. And this is a main driver of the computational cost of this type of algorithm. Okay, so um, how do we measure the performance of an MCMC algorithm? So different ways, depending on what you want to do. But let's say that you want to estimate an expectation. So typically then, uh, a very good measure for the performance is the uh, so-called asymptotic variance. So it's essentially the variance, the limiting variance, if you do the standard um, central limit theorem um, uh, on your estimator. And you can decompose the, um, the asymptotic variance as a product of two terms. The first term is just the variance under the stationary distribution of the function of interest. Um, the second term is called the integrated autocorrelation time, IACT for short. Um, so you can see here a very horrible formula. It's essentially the sum of all correlations at all lags. And what it does is it measures the loss in precision um, given the same number of samples going from IID samples to an MCMC, to the MCMC algorithm you're using, okay? So a high and integ integrated autocorrelation time means that you'll need to get more samples from your MCMC algorithm to get the same precision as with the IID samples. So um, intuitively, it's clear, well, it's not entirely clear right now, but if you think about what um, having a high variance likelihood estimator means is that in many cases you'll be um, over or underestimating the, um, the likelihood ratio and as a result you may be rejecting moves that would have been accepted otherwise. So as the rejections go up, so does the integrators of correlation time uh, and indeed if you look at empirical results you can see the um, as the variance of the likelihood ratio estimator. So obviously you may wonder how it's estimated. It's estimated at some central value of the parameter, which we know a priori or we, we get from a preliminary run. And here's the integrator correlation time and it's going up, okay? Um, so what do you want? You want essentially to minimize the variance so that you minimize the integrator correlation time. But obviously to do that, you need to use more particles in your um, likelihood estimator. And using more particles means that you're increasing the compute time, the computational cost per iteration of the algorithm. And when we're talking about running this for tens or hundreds of thousands of iterations, um, having a high cost per iteration can be quite um, expensive. So we can't just use more particles because that increases the cost. So we want to balance the two. So essentially, uh, we one, one idea is to try and minimize what we call the computational time, which is essentially the ratio of the IACT divided by the variance. So um, essentially this captures, so if the variance is proportional to one over n, if you're using n particles, then it's roughly n times um, the integrator of correlation time. So again, the dependence um, of uh, the variance is a little bit unclear and we can't really analyze directly the computational time because it's very complex and intractable. So uh, essentially what we do is we try and study a limiting type of regime where the algorithm becomes nicer and then we can say something about it. Um, the alternative is to, you can also analyze it a different way. Again, there will be some approximations, um, but in any case. So the nice thing is if you plot it, it confirms the intuition that um, as sigma, so as the variance increases or as the number of particles goes down, then indeed there is um, at some point uh, uh, an optimum. So essentially we want to aim for this type of region. 
Now, obviously, this will depend where this happens, depends on the algorithm and on the target. But um, at least under some assumptions, we can get some limiting results that uh, try to abstract from the specifics and um, capture some type of, and can give some type of guideline. So um, we're studying what happens as the amount of data, the amount of observations uh, goes to infinity. So uh, we let the number of particles scale like um, uh, proportionally to the number of observations. And then you can get essentially a, this type of central limit theorem. Now, this once again confirms that you need a number of particles that's proportional to the number of observations to be able to get stable behavior. Otherwise, you're likely the, um, this limit would be trivial, either zero or um, it would blow up. So the take-home message is that the likelihood ratio estimator needs uh, a number of particles proportional to the um, number of observations to control the variance of the estimator. And here you can see the, the log normal distributions from various runs. So um, I'll, I'll yeah, okay. So, okay, so under some assumptions, so specifically we assume that as the number of observations increases, your posterior concentrates at rate one over root t. Uh, around some type of central uh, value, um, and we use a proposal with variance that scales with t as well. Okay, and then what we do is we look at the resulting algorithm. We rescale, we we um, center it around um, this central value theta hat t, and we rescale space by square root of t. And then essentially we get a limiting Markov chain with a certain kernel given here. Now, um, this is something called the penalty method. It's been used as an approximation to the pseudo-marginal before. It's like doing um, the trouble says things uh, with a log with uh, the limiting distribution of the noise. So the noise is, um, is uh, log normal. Okay, so um, you can see here the uh, acceptance rate at the top and the integrated correlation time as the number of particles uh, increases and as a function of uh, sigma. And then we can try to optimize this, at least for the limiting uh, kernel. And indeed, you can uh, do this. And the, the take home message is that the answer really depends on the quality of your proposal. So if your proposal mixes very well, then, um, then you should, okay, so, right. So it yeah, so if your proposal mixes very well, you should pick the variance, you should set the variance by tuning the number of particles to be around one. Uh, the standard deviation of the variance for poor proposals, you should aim for something higher. Okay, obviously in most cases you won't have any clue about the quality of the proposal. So then we did various experiments and it seems that um, you're better off by um, over uh, undershooting. So if you set the, the standard deviation around 1, even if the optimum was the 1.7, you only increase your computing time by around 50%, otherwise you may increase it by much more. It's got to do with a little bit of an asymmetry in that um, plot I, I showed you earlier. Okay, so the problem again is that if you want to talk about computational cost, you've got um, a cost of roughly t per iteration because you need a number of particles that scales with t and you need... Uh, um, and again, each of those will cost t, so you're roughly t squared per iteration, which is pretty expensive, uh, given especially that you'll need to run it for a very long amount of time. Now, if you do simulated likelihood, you can get away with using a number of particles that scales like square root of t. A little bit more is fine. So the question is, can we improve uh, the pseudo marginal? The answer uh, comes in looking at the ratio rather than in the individual estimators. So if you look at how we're estimating the, um, we're estimating at the moment the likelihood of the, at the proposal and at the previous um, parameter value independently. So the idea then is if we introduce some correlation because these appear in a ratio, we can kill the variance of the ratio um, uh, potentially with a lot less particles. So we reparameterize everything so we can use um, Gaussians as the instrumental variables that go into the estimator and then we correlate them using a standard or regressive scheme um, again the uh, the likelihood uh, the um the acceptance ratio becomes is exactly the same uh, as before um, that's because um, we've we've chosen this particular proposal so with a different proposal this may not actually be the case and now we can get again a, um, a log normal a limit for the ratio for the log ratio estimator 
but now we only have to use uh, a number of particles that grows with t, goes to infinity with t. So for example, you can use a logarithmic number of particles and you can get away and the variance will be controlled. Okay, so, um, uh, okay, right. So again, we can do a similar scaling uh, analysis and we get a similar, um, a similar like penalty method type uh, limit. Okay, so everything seems to be working great. So one catch is that um, for the pseudo marginal, it seems that at least the range where the limit uh, works, it actually gives you information for the full range. Whereas here, this seems the previous result seems to su suggest that we can actually take a logarithmic number of particles, logarithmic in T. Uh, the problem is that if you do that, the integrated correlation time suddenly blows up. If you take uh, n to scale um, to be um, smaller than root t, roughly. So it's not exactly a direct line from the, from the limit theorem to what you can actually do in practice, but we can actually get away with using a root t number of particles. And, um, um, and the variance works great, and I'll, I'll show you in a moment computationally what type of results you get. This is for independent date, like for um, uh, random effects models. For state space models, if the dimension of the parameter goes up, there is a penalty um, that you pay. Uh, it has to do with the way the particle filter is implemented because you need to somehow sort the particles. And in high dimensions, you can do that using some type like of uh, Hilbert curve. But essentially, the limit there comes from the fact that no matter how much you correlate the noise, the correlation in the, um, uh, in the ratio, in the likelihood estimators, stops growing or grows much, much more slowly than in the independent case. So at some point you get diminishing returns and you kill the mixing of, uh, of your process. Okay, so you can see here the results. Uh, I think that this is from, this is from a pretty uh, easy model, but uh, even for this type of model, the standard pseudo marginal uh, requires 5,000 particles to get a relative um, IACT of 2.2, we can get better than that with just 35 uh, particles. So you get a massive improvement by correlating, and I think the correlation is uh, was very close to 0.99, probably higher than 0.9, the correlation in the, in the noise variables. Okay, so I'm just going to finish uh, very quickly about um, another um, uh, result. So um, when you've got lots of observations, then uh, it's sometimes desirable to not use all of them. So there's lots of sub, sub, sub sampling uh, ideas that um, uh, in the literature, uh, because otherwise, again, even standard um, MCMC, you need to cycle through T observations. So uh, very quickly citing some of uh, the results out there. Um, now, Another idea is to use a slightly different acceptance probability. So this is related to Barker's algorithm. Yeah, if you're um, familiar with it. So essentially, you factorize it. So you get an always smaller acceptance probability compared to um, a metropolis Hastings. So that should, in principle, tell you that it's not going to be as efficient. But the good thing about this is that um, there are very fast ways of um, essentially generating events with the acceptance probability that you like. And the way of doing that is by there's very fast algorithms for generating Bernoulli random variables. Um, you need some assumptions, obviously, but the amazing thing is if you've got uh, sufficient regularity in your likelihood and so on and so forth, and you use a, um, a control variant, you can actually get a cost that um, um, the number of passes through your data actually goes to zero as the number of observations increases. It's not a miracle. Essentially, what it's telling you is that your um, model is concentrating towards a Gaussian and you practically don't need a metropolis correction. Okay? Um, so, um, and yeah, you can prove also geometric addition and all that, but the great thing is that you need many, many less passes through your data. Okay. So here are a few um, uh, references. So this is the paper I didn't talk about, uh, but essentially you can do this type of thing. It's, it's based on coupling, and you can generate unbiased estimators of expectations. Uh, of course, you, can, you have to uh, be able to get two chains to couple, so it's not for free again. And that's, that's it. Thank you very much.
Thank you, uh, George, for uh, this wonderful talk. Uh, questions? Uh, right? Um, sorry. Thank you. Thanks. A lot of your interesting results. Um, can you comment on the two different penalty methods that you that you find? Yeah. Like, where so do we see the correlation? Only one of them is the um, true penalty method. So in the correlated, the limiting chain is a chain only on the parameter. So this is the true penalty method. For the standard pseudo marginal, uh, the noise doesn't decouple from the parameter. So essentially, in the correlated, mm -hmm. the noise decouples from the location of the parameter, and that's why you get the standard penalty method. In the standard pseudo marginal, it doesn't fully decouple. You still have some dependence, um, and that's why you need to have a chain of both the parameter and the noise. So this is the difference. So the true penalty method is the one where you, which you get as a limit yes. for the correlated um, pseudo marginal. Cool. Any other questions? Um, I have one. So what, how, for example, would this algorithm work for models where we have time dependent parameters, for example? How would we tackle? So, OK, so you have um, so, for example, what do you want? You want in the, um, in the state space model this theta to vary from time to time. Okay, so it will definitely increase the dimensionality. And is it deterministic or is it random? Is it... Uh... Let's, let's go with deterministic, for example. Okay. I mean, if you can somehow, if you can write it down in terms of some fundamental underlying hyperparameters and then embed the dynamics into this model, the dynamics of the parameters, which you can maybe do with a little bit of work, then you're back into this situation. Now, if the parameters are truly changing in a way that you cannot really encode here, then it will probably increase the dimensionality of the problem mm -hmm. quite significantly, and then uh, it will be much, much harder. But it would still work, or...? Uh, it would still work. I mean, assuming that your observations are still independent, it's just that at the moment, the likelihood ratio estimator takes a product and all of these um, terms are roughly the same, just evaluate a different particle. So you could take g theta, 1 theta, 2 theta, 3, and so on and so forth, and it'd be fine. Um, um, but if you have many more parameters to infer, then... Uh, uh, the dimensionality will go up, so um, it will, you will probably need to run things for much longer. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Okay. Thanks, Ivana. Um, I was wondering, so your rho, which is the autocorrelation in the noise, as far as I understood it, is that, that's estimated as part of the, the MCMC? No, okay. No, so we, so that's, that's sort of a hyperparameter that we tune. It's like part of the tuning of the algorithm. So if you essentially tune this to get the likelihood rate, the variance of the likelihood ratio estimator um, at some central value to be what you want it to be. And are, are there any sort of heuristic ways that you would go about uh, tuning that automatically? Um, you can roughly, so in the, in the independent case, I think the guideline is something like 1 minus 1 over n, where n is the, um, or 1 over t, something like that, so the number of uh, observations. Um, if you, um, in the state space model, I think it's slightly more complicated because you have to take into account the fact that you can't push it too close to 1, um, because otherwise it, you, it, you're getting diminishing returns and you're just killing the mixing. So, but we do have guidelines in the paper for how to, uh, to tune that. Great, thanks. Any other questions? Up here. Sorry, here's the other one. So in the subsampling case, what's the final conclusion? I missed it, so you use barkers. Kernel. So you use Barker's, then essentially you have to simulate, so you just propose and then you have to simulate to accept the certain probability. So you can think of the accepting the certain probability as generating an event of that probability and if the event happens you accept, otherwise you reject. Mm. 
So, um, because you factorize, um, you can think of that as essentially a product of indicators for different Bernoulli variables. So, if as, as soon as one of them is zero, you reject. So, your rejections are going to be much cheaper. Um, to, to accept, you have to essentially check that all of them are one, but there is a fast way of checking whether um, they're all one or there is at least one which is zero. There, um, there is an, um, um, there's a method called the alias method, uh, Walker's algorithm. Essentially, they're based on tabulation. And so that's uh, a key part of being able to do that. And you need some regularity conditions on the likelihood so you can build some efficient upper bounds. It's also related to Poisson thinning. So one way to think of it is essentially you generate uh, Poisson with a high um, rate and then you thin it um, accordingly. Um, and depending on whether you use a control variant or not, you can keep the, um, the number of, the, you can take mini batches of order one as the mm -hmm. increases, or you can take mini batches of order, I think it's one over root t or one over t, something like that, in the limit. But again, it's like in the situation where essentially you don't really need to do MCMC, like a Laplace approximation in that case would give you equally yes. good results. So again, it's the control value trick that will... Yeah, exactly. It's essentially science you're, science. You're, you're saying it's Gaussian because yeah, you've yeah. got a lot of data and you're doing a Gaussian approximation and the Gaussian approximation is so good, yes. you don't need to correct. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Okay, do we have any more questions? Well, then let's join uh, thanking George for the wonderful talk.